Welcome to the Nuts and Bolts of Real Estate. My name is Joe Bauer. I'm here with my co-host, Julie Clark. Julie, how are you doing today? I am doing absolutely, totally fantastic, Joe. Yeah. Although I haven't had that special drink I keep telling you guys about yet today. So I am, I am slightly low on energy, but because we have our awesome friend Jennifer Beatles here with us, I think I'm about to get overly excited, as you know I can do. Looking forward to catching up with Jennifer and giving us a little lesson on uh, what's going down in the market here. So welcome, Jennifer. Good to see you. Thanks. Thanks, Julie. Thanks, Joe. Super happy to see you both and be back here. Yeah, yeah. I think most of you guys, I would hope, have heard of Jennifer Beatles. Um, we've done multiple podcasts with Jennifer as our guest in the past, and Joe can drop those down in the, in the links below. Um, but if you haven't met her, you are going to thank me for this one today. So Jennifer, I'm going to let you, because you're, you've got multifaceted business model, give us a little high level of what Jennifer Beatles is all about. Yeah, absolutely. I wear uh, many different hats <laughs> in a given day. Um, I'm a multifamily investor. We own properties in eight different states. Um, I also own a real estate brokerage, but we only do business by referral, meaning that we refer uh, investors to agents. We also have a training program for agents that want to work with more investors. That's our agents invest. Uh, dot com if you want to learn a little bit more about what we do there. And then we have the ROI Inner Circle where we teach investors how to scale and build a massive portfolio so that they can eventually, I would say, replace their active income with passive income. And then Julie, I haven't told you this. I also have a new software company. Oh. We are launching next month. So we'll talk about it in person when we're in Coeur d'Alene together, um, but super stoked about that as well. Oh, what's the what does it do? Yeah, it's a software as a service. So we've developed a rent algorithm uh, that basically will estimate rents on any property, multifamily, single family, far better than Rentometer, Zillow, Hotpads, all of oh the uh, websites that can't really do multifamily. <laughs> Those are really, really tough to figure out rents there. Uh, we've also, you know, truly uh, stopped producing a crime map. And I think it was December of 2020. And so uh, we've developed our own crime map. It's going to help investors. Wow determine uh, where the best places to invest are in a given city, help them figure out the rent, and then also calculate a deal. So super oh. excited about that. Well, uh, well no surprise. Coming <laughs> from you. Cannot wait because yes, that is that is like the missing link, right? In yes. the market that's complicated. So fantastic. And congratulations. I can't Thank you. wait. So uh, it's been a lot of work. <laughs> learning more about that. Are you going to announce that in Idaho or in Coeur d'Alene or... Yeah, yeah, we're just we're just putting the uh, the finishing touches on the on the software, and so Fantastic. fingers crossed we'll be ready ready next month. Awesome. Well, we keep referring Jennifer and I keep referring to this event in Coeur d'Alene. If you guys have not heard about it, it is the what are we calling it? The Coeur d'Alene Real Estate Investors Summit in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, yes. happening October something like that. Joe's going to drop the information down below on the link there. It the lineup. I don't know. I am so impressed. Marishka is just insane. You know, if you want to meet other agents, investors, property managers, or whatever in the Pacific Northwest or in Eastern Washington, you know, you grow your business across the uh, mountains there. What an event to get to, to network and do that with people coming out of the Tri-Cities and Spokane and probably Oregon, Idaho, and all these places. We're not going to touch on the details to that there, but it's an insane lineup and you guys are going to walk away with so much information. You have no, I, I, you just can't lose, right? If you take action from that event. So hope to see you there. Um, Jennifer and I will both be there and we are both guests speaking at that event. So more on that below, but let's jump into it. So today I was thinking, hey, market shifted, rate, you know, interest rates are up, rents maybe are up, you'll tell us, and things have shifted in the market. And we want to check in with our number numero uno person that is on top of all that stuff and go straight to the source, Miss Jennifer Beatles, on what's going on, what she's up to. Has she gotten more aggressive? Did she, you know, make sure she re refinanced? What if people still have to refinance right now or get out of one of their bridge loans or something like that? And we're going to hear from Jennifer, who is make sure that we are headed down the right path today. So give us an overview of what you think's going on and what you're up to. Yeah. Gosh, where do we start? So 
Yeah. Yeah. Market has shifted massively. And, you know, I've been expecting this for some time. You, you can't print, uh, what do we, how many trillions of dollars put into the economy in the last 24 months and not you know, expect this massive inflation, right? And so obviously the Fed is trying to calm down inflation. The way that they're doing that is by increasing the interest rates. And I think we have a long road ahead to really get that dialed back in. I think that they're, you know, recently saying that they want to bring it back down to the 2% range. I don't know if we'll get there anytime soon. <laughs> I think. Right. Anyways. Crystal ball know, stuff there. I, right. I don't have my crystal ball today. Uh, certainly I'm not an economist. I'm just a real estate investor and I pay attention to patterns and I pay attention to trends and what's happening. So uh, we have seen a cool down in the market. And, and, I'm, and I'm kind of talking from the perspective as a multifamily investor. I don't uh, invest in residential properties. I don't invest in single family homes. So there's a big difference between- Cool down on what? Activity or- Yes. Yep. Sales? Activity, demand. I think a lot of investors that have gotten in in the past two years, um, I mean, if you, if you were an investor that got in in 2020- uh, you've had a great run. You you probably look like a genius. The last two years, your properties have gone up. I don't, depending on where you've invested, I don't know, 20, 30% maybe rents have gone up. Um, I think the average, you know, across the United States is like 13%, right? So everyone has looked good in the last two years. But the thing is, again, if you've just recently gotten started, then you don't know what a market shift feels and looks like. And so a lot of those people that have gotten in have now pulled back which means that the experienced investors who know how to take advantage of these market shifts, they've come back, right? So of course, I've still been buying in the last uh, 24 months. Um, I'm always buying. I don't care what the economy is doing. There are always deals in every single market. There's always a way that you can take advantage of whatever market shift we're in. Um, but I've gotten very aggressive. And so what we're seeing right now, I'm making probably three to four offers a week. And I would say most of those are considerably less than their asking price. Are they listed properties you're making offers on or just all of the above, all of the above, all of the above. I have one I'm working on right now. It's a 23 unit. I think they started at two and a half million. They bought it for 1.5 a year ago. So they started at 2.5. They, they were expecting to make a cool million dollars by doing nothing to this apartment complex. And um, question for you, I don't know the yeah. answer on, but on the residential side, because I'm a residential broker as well as a multifamily owner as well. But you know, when I see something like that, I look at. Well, I guess it's not because it's it's. It, I, I don't think it, since it's not a primary residence or something. My my first thought was, hmm, are, are any of those loans assumable? Sure. But I don't, but probably not because they're res they're investment property loans. No, right? oh, uh, absolutely. Commercial loans are absolutely assumable, right? So you have oh. to qualify. The only downside is it depends on when the note originated. Yeah. Because if they're selling it for so much of a higher price, then you're going to be buying in at like 50 LTV, which really isn't efficient, right? right? So sure, you might be able to get a you know 3.5% commercial note that has a couple of years left on it. But if there's a big difference between what they're selling it for, yeah. which is what that note value is, then you're going to have to have a big raise, right? There's a big difference in capital or down payment that you need to, to bring in um, in order to do that. So you can get pretty creative with that. Mm -hmm. what, if they re what if they've owned it a long time and they just refinanced it? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, you're looking for 20% yeah, for sure. down, right? So that's the kind yeah. of stuff I'm paying attention to that nobody's talking about on the residential yes. side. And that makes me different, right? Because I'm able to that's a thought that crosses my mind. If, if I'm like, just because they've owned the property a long time, doesn't mean that they didn't refinance up to 80% or something when the rates were low. And maybe there's an opportunity there. I don't know. It's always the first question you should ask, right? right? Do they have an assumable mortgage? What is the current balance of uh, the balance, right? Exactly. So, Are you guys absolutely. seeing more sellers? Are you able to lean on sellers? Like, Hey, rates are high. This ain't happening. We're, you know, we need some seller financing and that they're saying yes more easily right now due to that or not. Yeah, we're seeing some of it. It's really deal dependent. A lot of sellers that we're seeing right now are tired landlords or they're looking to retire. And so, you know, it, it kind of depends. I'm seeing a lot more sellers that are just wanting to put capital in the bank right now. They're wanting to get liquid uh, for whatever reason. Obviously, that's not tax efficient. <laughs> They'd be, you right. know, uh, making a lot more if they offered seller financing, but I'm seeing those conversations happening more regularly right now and conversations related to creative financing as well. 
Absolutely. So when you're making your aggressive offers right now, are you offering three options or are you just yes. gotcha? And what three options are those? Yeah. So typically it's an, you know, an offer that's like, this is what we're going to finance with. Typically we're doing a bridge loan, depending on if the property is stabilized or if it's value add. Number two would be some kind of creative financing. Either we'll do a, a subject to a wrap or a seller finance. Option three, we've actually had some sellers that have been interested in partnering and you know, taking some basically seller proceeds and reinvesting in the down payment. That's another really interesting way that you can you can do it. But yeah, I, I have like, I don't know, maybe 11 to 14 different options that I kind of run through with every property. How and about, I basically how about have you ever find, thought about a master lease? Yes, a, a lease master option. lease could work as well. Uh-huh. Yeah. Or lease super option. Cool. I've done lease option before. Love yes. that. That is super cool, right? Yes. Like I guess I guess in an apartment, a lease option would be a master lease, right? Well, a lease option would be uh, you know, basically you have the option agreement, the purchase and sale agreement, and a lease agreement similar to a master lease with that sublet. So yeah. you can do it that way for sure. Right. Or you can just, you know, typically in a master lease, there's not like a predetermined purchase price. You basically just have a master lease on the property. So you're kind of taking over, I guess, quote unquote, like operations. Similar right. to how how a hotel would operate. Oh, not so a lot of fun. options right now. So many fun. options, so much fun. It's really exciting. Yeah, but right now we're seeing, um, you know, on the commercial side, they're not necessarily reducing their prices, but a lot of the agents will say, give me an offer. Yeah. Any offer will consider. And so it's interesting. So residential, uh, you know, I feel like there's more uh, willingness to reduce the price, to generate buyer activity, things like that. On the commercial side, again, not so much. So on that 23 unit deal, they were at 2.5. They dropped it to 2.2. I'm going to be making an offer at 1.7. And there's a high probability that they'll take that. Right. And, and are that those like that group right there, they're wanting to cash out and put money in the bank? Or because sometimes I think like I have just got a, a seven unit as a broker that I've been working on for a year and a half in West Seattle. Big, yep. big one, a big, you know, really good one here for street cred under contract. And the, the, the incentive was that we, we were able to find the, re, the place where she's not doing a 1031, but mm-hmm. just found she lived in the building. And we were, because the market has shifted guys, we were able to make a contingent offer for her on her next resident because those mom and pops that live in the building, your world just opened up and you can entice them yes. with, Hey, you know, deferred maintenance or whatever, let's get you out of there in this nice clean place. And we can do that on a contingent offer now. And that's what we've been able to do yes. after a year and a half because the market pivoted, mm. boop, boop, you know, love that stuff. You guys like, I, I like the creative nature of like reverse engineering, how to have those conversations, which is my whole hot topic these days. I call it how to speak modern real estate, which is what I'm going to be speaking about in Coeur d'Alene. And that applies not, I'm a broker, but I'm an investor. I own apartments. It applies to everyone all investors of any type, all wholesalers, all everybody, to, you have to learn how to speak modern brokerage, right? These things that we're talking about with assumptions and master leases and dangling the carrot of, you know, now you can go, right? I mean, that's what I've told the wholesalers. Like if you had clients that didn't want to sell because they needed to move out somewhere, you better call them back up right now. You have who knows how long, and that is going to work out for you right now. Yeah. It's it's being more of a consultant, right? I think agents themselves as salespeople, you know, you put a sign in the yard, you throw some photos up on the MLS, you field a couple of calls and and your job is done. In today's market, in this shift, you have to be more of a problem solver. Your point, Julie, means that you need to come up with creative solutions to your client's problems. And, and here's the thing, that way. you don't have to be the expert at mm-hmm. those solutions. You just have to have your hybrid team in place of that. You know, that those exist and you know who to call for that. I'll call hybrid partnership for that situation to help you get through it or whatever. Right. We don't need, all need to be experts at everything. We just need to know who is Agreed. right. I'm so excited. So is the market Have you, so you're in eight different states, you said, has any of them dropped off your list or have any states added to your list? And why are you picking those eight states? Sure. So I don't invest in Washington state anymore. (laughs) It's very unpopular opinion. Don't say any deals. Understood. (laughs) Right. Well, yeah. I mean, the the just cap rates don't make sense. Can't meet my debt coverage ratio for commercial loans. Became a very 
unfriendly place to do business as a landlord. So to answer your other question, why am I in the States that I'm in? It's because they're landlord friendly. Yeah. Uh, it's easy for me to transact and do business in these States because I'm able to hit the returns that I'm after. I'm able to uh, find nicer, newer properties, B-class properties in B-class areas, places where tenants are moving to, where they want to live. Just, you know, again, a lot of reasons for investing in these states. Hey guys, it's Julie here with a quick break from the show to discuss an opportunity some of you may have interest in, which is to work more closely with me. On almost a daily basis, I get calls from investors and brokers, both new and experienced, asking me for guidance or advice. I love helping you guys out and it keeps me on my toes too. So with that said, I wanted to let you know that I have a private broker coaching community called the VIP Education Community. And the best part is that it's 100% free. That's right. It's free to join. So whether you're a traditional broker or a broker investor, my VIP education community offers personalized one-on-one coaching from not just me, but also from my experienced broker friends with expertise in all disciplines of real estate and real estate investing. We'll teach and share our modern marketing strategies, our tech and lead generation resources, plus teach you how to identify or offer up opportunities for yourself or for your clients using tech Techniques such as seller financing, lease options, land entitlement deals, burr investing, flipping, multifamily or commercial coaching, whatever you like, we've got it all covered for you. The future of real estate is changing fast and to stay in the game, it's time to learn about all the options you can offer your buyer and seller clients, as well as if you want, learn how to use those skills to grow your own real estate portfolio. If you'd like more details about joining my VIP education community, reach out to me at julie at seattleinvestorsclub.com or text me at 206-910-2985 or just send me a Facebook message. My new favorite phrase is community equals confidence. So let's navigate the future of real estate together. Now back to the show. Are you buying purely value add or are you just going cash flow? You don't need to make a bunch of improvements if it hits your number. Yeah. Most of the time we're looking at value add. However, sometimes we get into deals and we, we just go in there and improve the rents Yeah, and, and that does it. So my husband just got back. He flew out to Michigan, then drove to Kentucky, then drove to St. Louis and just came back. So he visited three different states we own properties in. And we bought this seven unit in December of uh, last year. So 2021. And we were expecting to put, so it was about like $12,000 a unit to get the rents from $750,800 to about $1,200. Yeah. And our property, so, so that was our, that was our value add strategy. Um, and, and the building was going to, we, we bought it for 775. We were expecting it to be worth over a million. Uh, we went in and the property manager said, you know, it's winter time, right? In Michigan. So she said, yeah, let's not kick everybody out. Let's just increase the rent. So we improved the rents to about $900 a unit. Everybody stayed, everybody paid. There you yes, go. we're still under market. Right. But now I think taking our, you know, like cap rate approach, it's like worth, I don't know, like 950 or something like that. So yeah. sometimes that works too. And what I think- What are cap rates out in the Midwest like that in Kentucky and these places? What are cap rates? Yeah. Well, so these are B-class assets, right? So these are nice yep. Yep. properties, anywhere from six and a quarter, six and a half. Okay. Yeah. We can improve that to getting them to be, you know, an eight, eight and a half, nine, sometimes even- Do you, you know, have higher. an analysis that you do where- you know, you're going to buy it at a higher cap because it needs a value add situation, right? Yes. So you might buy it at an eight cap. Do you have a rule of thumb that you then want to make sure that you're going to have like a cap rate spread of a point or something, point and a half? Do you get what I'm saying? Once it's stabilized, the cap rate will go down. Of course. Right? Yes. So you're buying on average. Always, yep. Is to always buy at a high cap and sell at a low cap. Okay. Right? Right. And do you, do you look at that? Like, do you look like I got at least a point spread there or is that you just have more detail on your numbers and you're not? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I look at the potential exit cap and I'm also very conservative. So typically I use the same entry cap or even, you know, maybe a little bit higher as my exit cap. So if I'm buying in at a six and a quarter, then I'm going to assume that I could probably sell at six and a quarter. Right. Right. So yeah. assuming that that the market doesn't improve, the demand for investment properties doesn't really go anywhere, but obviously my NOI is going to be so much higher because I'm going to reduce expenses and improve the um, 
improve the rent, right? Yeah. Improve the, the income. So that's a metric that I look at. But What's I'm always debt still, service coverage running these days. The what? The debt coverage? Debt service coverage. It's going to depend on the market. So mm-hmm. in these small sub markets, you might be looking at 1.3. Okay. And you know some of these like tier one markets, you're going to be like, like Seattle, right? The yeah. coverage ratio is you know 1.2, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which is which is really quite low, right? <laughs> you're not going to cash flow yeah. at a at a, at a 1.2. And so yeah, you know a lot of the deals that I'm looking at, our debt coverage ratio is 155, 1. Seven sometimes, okay. which is obviously you know it, it's conservative, um, but that's also where you get the cash flow, right? Okay. And this is even underwriting with the higher rates. So a year ago, we could get bridge loan, bridge debt for maybe I don't know five, five and a quarter. Yeah. Right now we're paying seven, right? Yeah. <laughs> but we're underwriting at a stabilized, you know, maybe like five point five, almost even six percent. And these deals are still making sense. How long so, is the term on your bridge loan? Yeah, it's usually going to be 24 months, 12 to 24 months, interest Mm -hmm. only. Yeah. So that's our stabilization period. So Um, are you still thinking about interest rate risk going forward, increasing still on your stable refis? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. What are you building on that right now? Like, so you're at what, seven or something? Well, you're on your bridge at seven, but your stabilized rate would be what these days? I think right now it depends on the bank. It depends on the loan size. Depends on the area. I would say that most deals, you know, you're looking at maybe 5.5. I've also done some floats lately. Okay. So, you know, the banks are using the SOFR index now. <laughs> and I don't know what SOFR is today. Obviously, they recently went up because the Fed did another uh, rank increase. And so the banks will do a margin, right? So they'll do SOFR plus a margin. Yeah. Um, so I bought a 14 unit, I guess it was in June. And I chose to go with the float, which had no prepay. Okay. versus the fixed rate. So I could have got a fixed rate at that time at five and a quarter. I went with the float. My my float rate right now is 4.3. So gotcha. that's another option, right? right? So it's really going to depend on the deal. So that deal, it's hundred percent occupied. The rents are low. All we have to do, I think we have three units out of the 14 that need to be renovated. Everyone else just needs a slight rent bump. We're talking 25, 50 bucks a month. And so probably into next year, after we do that slight rent bump, will refinance if the rates are where we want them to be. If right. not, I'll just stay on the float. I have no right. prepay. I can secure that uh, refinance whenever I want to probably get 85% of my initial investment back and then lock that in and then just hold for 10 years. So exciting guys. It's so exciting. So you're still buying in the same eight States or have you added on any more? Yeah. So Ohio is a new state for, uh, well, so uh, Kentucky, uh, our, t- our deal is, is it's interesting. It's in the Cincinnati MSA, but it's on the Kentucky side. And so we're really heavy into Ohio right now. Love Michigan, love Missouri. We've got some deals going there. Tennessee is a fan favorite. I've been in Tennessee for a couple of years, uh, it's working really good there, but yeah, I, I'm always looking- weather, you know, do you worry about markets that have hurricanes and I mean, or you just get insurance and say, well, that's what insurance is for. You so know, they avoided Florida for that reason. Mm-hmm. I know, uh, you know, again, unpopular and opinion. flooding, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you know, it's really difficult. Uh, there's certain areas in Florida where the insurance providers have just pulled back and they yeah. say, we won't insure in these areas. I think people get so focused on, you know, let me get that good, good, good deal. And they just don't know enough to think big picture about how it's kind of like, you know, getting too excited about something. It's like Addison. We were just talking about guys that my daughter, sorry, my hair's bugging me here. My daughter's 14 and she's going to try and get a job up the street, this cool little neighborhood specialty pizza place. And I said, she's like, I I, want to make money. I want to be the first of my friends to get a job. And I said, that's all good, but you're going to have a job. You know, like that means you have to go there. It's not cool after about a month, right? That means you're just slogging. And I, and, and the point being that I think people get so focused on, let me get that deal. Let me get that deal that they don't realize that long-term management is much bigger than, you know, is a factor that needs to be considered, you know, don't buy in war zones, right. right? And stuff like that. This hence your crime map. Yes. Right. So you guys be careful on that stuff. Just because it's a good deal, you need, what? Well, let's talk about that for a second, Jennifer. Yes. Let's go over what would be, I know you have, you guys are going to get hooked up here at the end and learn how you can jump in Jennifer's world and become experts. 
I mean, we're talking, obviously, she's even building a software company for you guys. Um, you want to be connected to Jennifer. We, there's no question about it when people want to become real estate investors or agents want to become real estate investors. I'll, even, I, I even coach on my own real estate coaching program, but I say, go listen to Jennifer. She's got it already ready to go. I don't need to repeat what you have so eloquently and so you know, professionally put in place, right? I mean, you're the, you're the gal. Beep, beep. Boom, boom. So <laughs> it makes you. my life easy, right? Just kick them over to you. But what would you say when you are like are the top three or five mm-hmm. things that people want to check, you know, employment or whatever on a market that they want to invest in? And this is part of all her masterminds and education, but we're giving you guys a little special. Yeah, absolutely. So you want to be investing in areas where the population is uh, increasing, not declining. Right. So if more people are moving out of that area than are moving in, avoid it. They're moving out for a reason. Most likely that reason is there are a lack of jobs, right? Which would be number two is what are the job opportunities in that market? Is it a one industry, one employer town? If so, that means high risk. Uh, Another thing that I look at is I do have a minimum population in these cities that I'm investing in. I won't typically invest in a city unless it has a population of 40,000. Of course, a population of 40,000 that is increasing, not declining uh, over the last couple of years with some, uh, you know, basically multiple industries, job opportunities. That reminds me of Ryan Gibson's storage due diligence stuff, right? Mm, So not only are we looking at how many employers or how many people live there, the population, but do you also look, as is where my brain goes, how many units are in town for that, that exist already for that population? Is there a oversupply or an undersupply of the units? Not just the population, but could be 40,000 and there's, I don't know what percentage of them rent. This is all demographic stuff. And then, yes. I mean, you, you probably go deep on, you know, we're just covering the surface here, guys, but there's some mm-hmm. super fun nerd stuff that can go down deeper on these questions we're talking about. So absolutely. Yeah, I think um, the absorption rate is really important to look at too. That's probably like secondary. I probably look at that like after I get a deal under contract, just so that I can come up with a good uh, vacancy rate for that market. But yeah, most important is you know in- increasing population. You know, not a one industry town. Multiple opportunities for you know jobs. Uh, I look at wage growth as well. Are the like what's the median uh, household income in that market? Are they is, is that increasing or has it been increasing over time or is it basically staying the same? There's some markets that I that I am investing in where the wages have you know they've gone up a little bit, uh, you know, not massive improvement, which just basically means that you're you're probably not going to increase your rents you know 10 percent every year or what have you. So something to look at there. I also look for low crime rates. Right, so we've we've touched on that with the crime map. Just because it's it's harder to attract great tenants to an area that is you know high crime. Husband just got back from St. Louis. We own in St. Louis. St. Louis is I think in the top maybe five cities in the country for crime rates. Right, right? but we own in a neighborhood uh, that is very attractive to tenants, very low crime, very much you know B class area, and our our rents you know reflect that. Right, so we're not buying the five thousand dollars single family houses in the you know, D-class areas, the war zones, if you will, right? right. So really important to, um, you know, to look at the areas that you're buying in, make sure that the, you know, the metrics and the demographics make sense in that market. And Absolutely. make sure when you're buying these deals, these value-add deals, that you don't over-improve them for the area and the rent. Amazing point. Market. Yes. Right? I see that happening a lot. Like uh, Oklahoma City, so a lot of DFW buyers, the, you know, the hedge funds and syndicators, yeah. like Oklahoma City, started improving units, uh, basically to like the, uh, the, uh, DFW standard yeah. and tenants weren't willing to pay that. They said, right. it's great. It's nice, but they're not going to pay $150 over market for granite LVP and stainless steel. So I think you get market. investors that are, maybe they graduate from wholesaling and flipping into multifamily and even the flippers, I always challenge them. I'm like, you know, they just want their product and they want to do the work and they want it to look beautiful. Right. And it doesn't always make sense. Like I challenge you to not do that, to, to, to scale it back. You're going to make more money. You're going to get surprised. Somebody's going to pop you and the spread's even going to be bigger. I don't know about in this market for the residential 
that might not work right now for residential, but it's all about knowing being able to think this way and, and, and being able to um, identify the pivot time. What's your times rent qualifications on tenants? Is it two, three? Usually it's three times rent. Mm -hmm. Three times. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I I leave that all up to our property managers, but yeah, I mean, you could look at what the median income is, what the rents are that you're trying to shoot to, and you can reverse engineer to see if the rents you want to charge equate to the average. I love this kind of stuff. Boy. It's It's also an indicator to, to, to your point. Yeah. It is an indicator of, could you, uh, you know, bring the units up to like a higher standard, right? And potentially get higher rents. So in some areas with our software company, we've we've identified that of the median um, totally household income. And you know, like yeah. I'll give you an example. We identified this suburb outside of St. Louis called Arnold, Missouri. Nice. And I think the median household income in Arnold, Missouri is like sixty seven thousand a year, whereas the state of Missouri as a whole is like fifty four thousand or something, right? And so we found a lot of uh, nicer units or maybe rented for like 700, but the wages are high enough that support, you know, much higher rents. Right. And so then you take that information and you say, well, will the local property managers confirm this? Um, same thing happened in Spokane years ago. Spokane had like 1% growth. Not a whole lot was happening, but the units there weren't very nice, pretty low. And then a Seattle developer came in and developed the Kindle Yards area. And everyone in town thought they were crazy. They're like, nobody's going to pay $1,700 a a month for rent for a 2-1 townhouse. And they basically pre-leased everything. So they were like really, you know, high end. And now Spokane is a nice area. Rents are considerably higher. So you can use those kind of demographics um, and economics in a market to also kind of predict where it might be going. And I, and I think there's a balance because I used to own properties in the Tri-Cities, which is a boom and bust yes. town and, you know, 150 unit properties and stuff like this. And what would happen is that as soon as the market started heating up and the rents were going up, somebody build a building because there was room to build. Then the market goes back down, right, for however many years. And so, you you know, same thing. I own retail, uh, you know, strip center type stuff. And we got stung one time because there was too much new construction happening when we were doing our lease up and somehow somebody bought it and threw it over on my desk and said, congratulations, you own this retail strip center. And I'm like, well, you guys effed that one up because there's a hundred thousand square foot shopping, you know, street mall going in down the street here. And, 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 you know, you guys got to pay attention in some of the smaller towns, I think where there's, room to build and it's not dense. Like there's got to be kind of the right, maybe that's on the checklist, right? That there's a density check. Mm. Love this stuff. I could talk all day. I love this stuff. <laughs> so fun. It's really fun. Absolutely. It Treasure is. Hunting it's, for markets. It is. It's like, it's like being Sherlock Holmes and stuff like that. Excellent. So what about, are you feeling that some of the people in your world that got caught in rising interest rates, they were on a bridge loan or they didn't get done or I don't know. Who are the people that maybe are, have a little concern right now? What do those deals look like and when did they buy them, you think? Yeah. I mean, I would say that you know the window of opportunity for refinancing and locking in a super low interest rate is gone. We, we were telling everyone inside of our community, we don't know how long this will last. Take yeah. advantage of it now. So if you've missed that window, you're going to have to wait till the next time when they want to stimulate the economy, which they will right? History pretty much always repeats itself. The the Fed only has so many tricks in their bag. They will pull that low interest rate card back out at some point, right? Right. For anyone- And and part of being part of your community and joining your community and Seattle Investors Club is that you're going to talk about like, hey, everybody's going to get a heads up. Like, hey guys, heads up. Everybody start, you know, you don't have to be like the cowboy off on your own or cowgirl off on your own you know, because it's exciting and fun and you want to do this by yourself, the collective genius of the group can make or break and save you, in my opinion, right? hundred percent. Well, Julie, totally. I mean, you and I, we, we've seen this before, right? Yeah. You've been around, <laughs> you've seen more market shifts than I have, but you know, we, we, we notice these patterns because we've been doing this for so long. And so I think you and I do a great job of, you know, communicating what we're seeing so that people can pre- prepare who've not seen this before and maybe don't know what they don't know or don't know what to do. Right. Um, and so for anyone that missed that window, I think, you know, I've had investors over the years say you were far too conservative, 
Why are you underwriting everything as if we are in a recession? Well, because that's how I invest, right? I, I started uh, in 2007, you know, kind of somehow made it out unscathed. I think it's just because I was too young through the, uh, through the great recession, but I've always invested as if we were in a recession. So I've always, you know, underwrited with my exit cap rate on my refinance at a much higher, uh, much higher cap rate, yep. uh, much higher interest rates. And so I think, I think some of the syndicators are in deep water. Yeah. They essentially, we, uh, I, I just passed on a, on a deal. It was a redevelopment deal. Uh, and they were using an exit cap of four and a quarter. And this is not DFW. It's not Seattle. Yeah. It's not Atlanta. Uh, they had a 9% growth rate every year on the revenue, which those numbers probably could have been true. I don't know, a year ago. Right. And so they, they were projecting a 30 IRR. And then when you brought the numbers down to reality, it was like a 13. You right? know what? I want to talk about syndications. And then I don't know if you feel like saying you have a syndicator you like. I've been looking for an apartment building syndicator to invest with. I'll just say I love a Spartan Investment Group self storage. Those guys are so anal. Like you don't want to work for them. Maybe you do because they're awesome, but they're so anal. I kind of almost don't care what they buy because they're so conservatively anal, right? I find, and I'm going to give you guys a warning that there is, you know, the popular train, the speaking engagement train that people get on and they were great at, let's say flipping houses, or they had some success in this market that kind of was hard not to. Okay. So they had, they reinvested, they did a great job kicking ass with all that stuff. And now all of a sudden they realize they should be buying apartments and now all of a sudden they're syndicating. My answer is hills. No, do not be very careful just because somebody is on a stage talking and they have experience unless they have, I don't know, you know, seven, eight deals under their belt. One of the things I would ask them when you're interviewing them is what is the biggest issue that has ever come up mm -hmm. when you owned all these buildings? Like, tell me. And if they're like, no, we got it pretty good. We've managed it pretty, forget it. You want to know what effed you guys up and what did you do to recover? Right. I mean, I have a deal with Ryan where a tornado came through and blew down our whole, you know, RV park and they were boom on it in a second. All insured. They were just so on it. Right. Mm -hmm. Like that's, I don't even care. I don't want to think about it as a passive investor in a syndication. I want to know those guys are on it. I caution you guys, right? What do you think questions? Let's do that. That people should ask syndicators, you know, you gotta yeah. be. Yeah. Well, I think number one is every investor should be putting the time in doing deal analysis and underwriting, because that's how you are going to build that skill set and that skill stack in order to basically, you know, do the things that we're talking about. And yeah. so when you understand deal analysis, then you can analyze their deals. You know, I, I think experience is very important to your point, Julie. Um, also getting some questions around, yes, what has gone wrong and how did you solve that? Right. Um, no deal, you know, is, is perfect. There's always things that come up, but you want to make sure that that person is like solutions oriented. Right. And that they can kind of anticipate on how to solve some of these. I would go into their numbers. And what cap rate are they using for the exit cap? What is their, uh, what are they using for their financing Yellow terms? Expenses maybe, right? Yes. Yeah. Everything. And if they're painting a really rosy picture and they're using, again, a low exit cap rate, uh, unrealistic financing terms, unrealistic perform a rents, then to me, that indicates they're either inexperienced or they are on purpose <laughs> making the numbers look better then they would actually prefer they don't want to lose their capital partners and they need to place the money. Correct. You know? So yeah, yeah, yeah I, I'm with you. I, I think people need to proceed with caution and probably just... want to also see somebody who has exited, yes. like, you know, that they've exited a few deals and what actually really happened, not what they say it's performing so well. Yes. You know what I mean? That they've, that they've exited all such good stuff because you should be investing in apartment syndications. That's a great way to absolutely great way to invest. Um, are you guys taking on partners or are you guys using all your own money at this point? Yeah. So, you know, it's really interesting. We started with partners, pretty much everything was a partnership, JV partnership, because yeah. we had no money. 
Yep. And uh, worked for free for the first couple of deals to, yep. to really prove myself. And then uh, just started splitting everything 50 50. And then as we built up our own portfolio, you know, we just did the 1031 game and had a lot of our own money. And, you know, these days we are doing more JV partnerships. Um, I think it's a great option to help other people uh, kind of learn through the experience. Tag um, so along, like, ride along with an experienced absolutely. person. What does that structure look like? For it's really deal dependent. Yeah. Yeah. So typically, you know, my husband and I, we will handle the finding of the deal, underwriting of the deal, figuring out the right financing strategy, which is a whole like, another animal by its itself. Yeah. And, and then all the asset management. And then so typically we have people that come in as, you know, capital partners. Of course, we do meetings and reports and things like that. And yeah, it just depends on the deal, really. Right. Sometimes that means it's 50 50. Right. Sometimes you know, we'll get, we'll take a hundred percent of the upside, but then the capital partner gets like right. 10% preferred re- return. Right. So it, we also kind of try to match up. The so however the deal works out, like, you know, like you said, it's a, it's a jigsaw puzzle. Yes. And so you can, it's just like seller financing. It's like creative real estate. When you're yes. buying with creative real estate, you can put a JV deal together on however it works. So mm-hmm. everybody's satisfied. Right. Yes. So I think people get confused also, because I have some people that would like to invest with me. And I, this is how I grew up in real estate as well. So I worked for a very large private real estate investment company for literally 20 years. And after about eight years, I became a partner in all the deals that I touched, you know, big deals. Right. And so I know the structure because that's how I grew up. Mm -hmm. And what I think people get confused about is if you didn't, you know, what your equity is as the operations, like if you're the one doing the operations, you didn't find the deal, you didn't, your name's not on the loan and all that stuff. Guys, that's to me, that's like 10%. Mm-hmm. That's like 10%, maybe 15 after you're experienced or maybe mm-hmm. on small deals. Cause I'm talking about big deals. Like of course, you know, yes. 100, 200, 300, 400 deals. Maybe it can be a little bit more, but remember whenever you partner with somebody, Jennifer, you speak up here. If somebody owns, if you're on a commercial loan and somebody owns, what is it? 20% or more? Usually more than 20% then you're signing on the loan. Yep. Their credit matters. Yep. They can bring down the deal yep. as far as qualifying goes. Yes. Correct? Yes. So do they, does the bank, let's say I was 20% and you were 80% and my credit sucked and yours was good. Is it weighted or is it just a blend and it is the blend of us? Yeah. Well, it, it also depends on the deal, right? If the debt coverage ratio is is really good yeah. and you have, and it's also, I think it's also kind of how you set up the operating agreement. If it's okay. manager managed and that manager has 80% and there's a, you know, just another member, right. That has 20%. Then I think you can talk to the, the bank and say like, yeah. look, I am the manager. I own 80%. We don't need to look at this partners. Yeah. Uh, you I'm know, experienced. PFS. Yeah. And, and most, I would say nine times out of 10, they're going to say, yeah, I agree. That's fine. Right. Because it affects the interest rate also. Right. So it affects the, everything. The yeah, it affects everything. Yes. So what yeah, we're all the alternative, in a nutshell. So, yeah. The alternative is, is you put that person at 19%. Yeah, <laughs> right? Exactly. Say, right. All right. If the bank, if yeah. the bank draws a hard line on the 20, you yeah. say, great, we're going to make you 19%. Yeah. And I think I capped out at 17% on those deals. Right. But that's changed yeah. my life. Right. That's why I'm staring at 50 boats out here on, on freaking the water right here. Exactly. It's you got to do it. You it know, you can't, you cannot get wealthy off of your job, period. You gotta, you gotta get in there. And, and, and the last thing, as we start to wrap down here, we're so excited. You guys can come hang out with me and Jennifer, by the way. Yeah, let's nerd out. We're here at the Coral yeah, Resort. It's going to be so fun, right? You know, go for, we'll go for a walk. We'll hang out. We'll have some drinks or coffee or whatever. And we'll talk shop. But, you know, I think everybody, I think, would be so much more successful, so much more successful if it was taught to learn about the loans first. Because when you learn about the debt and what's available on the debt, how all the debt works, whether it's bank debt or seller financing or whatever creative stuff there is, all of a sudden you're looking at deals and there are so many more options on how to get them done if you understand how to pay for them. It's like backwards to go looking for deals and then figure out how to pay for them. You might pass on a deal because you don't understand that if you just tweak this or that on the financing or 
creative ask this or that, that that could have been a deal. That's such a valid point. And I have an example of this. I have a, an investor that's working on, it's a deal that's a little bit less than 40 units, right? And she was going to a traditional bank locally and they've been just dragging her through this process for months. Like we need your personal tax returns and yada, yada. You know, I look at it and I say, this deal is not stabilized. They're yeah. probably not even going to approve the loan right. anyway, by the time they get it to the committee, this needs a bridge loan. Right. And, and so, you know, reanalyze the deal, restructured it. At first, I think capital raise or, you know, the, the initial investment would be like 575. When you restructure it with the bridge debt, I think we brought it down to like 411, yeah. right? Cause we're going to, we're going to uh, finance in our renovations and anyways, changed everything. Right. So, so right. to your point, I think that that's a very, very valid point. I, I, there's a number of skill sets. I think that investors need, uh, financing is, is you guys them. just need to hang out with somebody like Jennifer or me or whoever, and just, it only takes a while to have repetition to get it right. It, it's not rocket science. It's oh, just oh, absolutely. aware. I think yeah. it's just awareness. People just aren't aware with that said, can you explain what a bridge loan is and how that sure. works? Yeah. So a bridge loan is a commercial loan that basically is the bridge to get you to stabilization. That is when a property is not stabilized. So let's say first what a stabilized property is. This is where your debt coverage ratio is over that 1.25. You know, maybe there's some room to add value, right? But it's not stabilized from the either the debt coverage ratio or the occupancy. That could be the physical occupancy or the economic occupancy, right? So I had a 36 unit that I was working on, physically occupied. We were at like 95%. Economic occupancy was like 80 because we had multiple tenants that were over 90 days past due. Right. And so your agency lenders, the, 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 the stabilized lenders want to see an occupancy rate above 90%, right? right. So they're going to count any uh, tenant that's past 90 days past due or as a vacant, as a vacant yeah. unit. Right. Or when you're in lease up of like a building, like 40 or units, physical you might give a concession. You might say first yes, month free during your lease. Lost up lease. Yeah. That'll affect your economic Agreed. 90%. So the bridge allows you to basically get the building stabilized so that you can refinance with either a, a local bank or with a, you know, an agency lender agency debt uh, with a stabilized loan. So basically it's going to be a higher interest rate to get you. And then a lot of times too, you can finance in your renovation. So that's the beauty yeah. of these loans is, you know, they'll typically go, I would say like 70 to 80 loan to cost right. as opposed to loan to value. Right. And so rather than bringing in all of that renovation, either raising it or putting it out of pocket, they're going to finance that in. They're going to do as again, 70 to 80% loan to cost. And then you're going to pay a higher interest rate right now. It's again, about 7%. Right. That for one year, interest only, and then put it into a stabilized loan, longer term. And so, and so what that means is when you're going to buy a property and let's say you, you need to put 25% down, but you need to spend 75,000 on a renovation of the property. You don't want to put your 25% down plus the 75 exactly. or hundred. Exactly. You know, now you've got all that money in there. So the bridge loan allows you to build in that 75 grand. So instead of putting 25% down plus that you're putting only 20% down of the total. Yes. Right. And then, you know, it maybe you could do two deals down. as opposed to one, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then and it, yes. And it, so it lowers your down payment requirement yes. and then you get a interest only payment because you've borrowed all this money more than the property cash flows, maybe, or only like at a one-to-one -one or something like that. And then your goal is to raise the rents or do whatever your project is to build it up to the 1.25 debt service coverage ratio with 90% economic occupancy and then refinance, right? Yes. And pull out as much as you can and go do it again. Yes. That's, that's how it works, right? So you guys need to know this stuff. Do bridge loans allow second lien position? Depends on the lender. Most of the time, no. But so that's why you want a JV partner, guys. Yes. So that's why you want the JV partner. Yes. And it can't be that they just loan you the money as a private lender because, right. or could it, you know, it needs to be more of a partnership. Yeah. They need to play an active role. Active is not necessarily defined, but, you know, talk to your attorney about that. But the, the difference between the JV and the syndication 
is the active participation and also the number of investors, right? You, you so wait, can't... say that again. The difference between JV and syndication is the active participation by the smaller investor. Correct. The lower percentage investor. Correct. That's... It's also the number of investors in a deal. Like right. you, you probably couldn't, like a, a 10 person JV deal probably wouldn't fly. I think it'd be really hard to say that 10 different people play an active role, depending on, and right. I guess depending on the deal, right? Right. And so I think you want to be careful there. You, you don't want to be selling securities. Right. Uh, accidentally. Say, that gets to the SEC, right. you know, stuff, right? So, Correct. I mean, the best thing, honestly, like me, I've got my VIP education community and we're like, let's go buy some apartments together, right? And just get with your friends and, and pull your money together. And, you know, I said, okay, you guys go find it. You know, I'll put the down payment money. I don't want to run it. You guys run it. I'll provide the asset management and you guys got to fly down there and all this other stuff. And so, you know, those types of deals, what do you think of the Las Vegas market, by the way? (laughs) Uh, I think it's interesting. There's a lot of inward population migration to that market. Uh, Some job diversification non-income tax state, right? So there's a lot of things going for it. There's um, one on the list, non-income tax state. Is that on your list of your eight states? Yeah. I mean, it's it's important. I wouldn't say that it's, uh, in, you know, in the top five, top 10. What um, is the top one besides besides jobs and population? Yeah, you know that. Uh, increasing population, population growth. And beyond that, what is it? Is it landlord friendly? Yeah. So landlord friendly, I would say is in the top five for sure, but it's population growth job diversification, low crime. And then it's just, the numbers just have to make sense too. Right. So let's like define, Washington- let's define, though, let's define what, let's define what landlord friendly means for people. Yeah. Well, so it probably means something a little bit different to me than uh, anyone else, but, or, or another investor. But yeah, for me, so landlord friendly means that, you know, the eviction laws are such that I can enforce my lease. Let's just, let's just say that. Right. So in some, mar- like I'll, I'll give you uh, let's see, I think Massachusetts is a state that has very unfavorable landlord tenant law. It could take you up to six months to get an eviction processed. Right. Um, there's other, there's certain municipalities, right. I, I've kind Little. of stayed it's out terrible. of the, yeah. Yeah. So like uh, St. Paul, Minnesota, is one of the strictest, has one of the strictest landlord laws in the entire country. It's even worse than Seattle or worse than Portland. And they have this, you know, rent control, but it stays with the unit, not with the tenant. Right. And so That's terrible. Right. It's, it, it, it is terrible. Right. I mean, you, you wouldn't have the government go tell a plumber, you can only charge so much. You can only charge so much for your plumbing business or your materials or whatever. But, you know, for some reason in certain municipalities, the cities decide that it's on them or it's their responsibility to dictate the laws and so I just, I just stay out of those areas. Right. Um, and it's unfortunate because then typically you have a lack of housing because investors don't want to buy and they're not you know, going to be going into that market, creating you know, new affordable housing. And so then it just makes it more expensive, which is yeah. really unfortunate. And it, and it you know, lessens the, the inventory. Are you doing your uh, short-term rentals yourself? No. Okay. Why? I, I, that is not in my wheelhouse. I okay. do not want to, uh, I've, I have some strong opinions on short-term rentals. It's just yeah. not my wheelhouse. Yeah. Stay in your lane. Stay, stay in my what lane. About, what, about, what about what uh, about allowing some of your units at some of your bigger properties? Maybe it doesn't work because of where they're located and it doesn't isn't a fit. But the whole corporate housing, you know, like Oakwood or whatever, right? Have you ever thought about that to yes. allow them to take twenty percent of the units and and you charge the premium? And yeah, I mean, I think midterm rentals can make a lot of sense. Again, I want to be an asset manager and not an operator. Yeah. So I want to have no part in the operations. I I want to hire the operator. That's my property manager. Allow them to do their part and then be the asset manager that just helps out with strategy. But on corporate rentals like that, like Oakwood or whatever, don't they run? They run the whole thing, right? You're just yeah, signing. I'm, yeah, I'm not familiar with Oakwood or what that what that yeah. looks like. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, think it's- I think it's an interesting concept. We have a couple of rentals in well that that probably could work for that. Not every area, right. It's going to work for that. But yeah, I mean, we've just, we've just done so well with the very boring, non-sexy long-term totally. rentals where it's very, very easy to predict the revenue, the valuation. So we just, we just stay in our lane. We just, What's the smallest uh, number of units you want to buy these days? Yeah. I mean, it's 10 plus units. 
that, that gets to be pretty small. I won't buy anything under 1.2 million. Why is that? Uh, it's hard to get loans. It's so, and this is going to sound a um, little, little backwards, but it's so much easier to get loans that are a loan amount of at least a million dollars. It's just, you know, you can do non-recourse, you get, you have better terms. It's just- Let's cover that one second. When, when is something recourse versus non-recourse? Like yeah. when can you get away from that? And that means that you're personally guaranteeing on the loan versus Correct. your lot. That's what Correct. Now there's some, some standard carve outs, right? I mean, if yeah. you, if you, uh, what is it like fraud or environmental? Like, yeah. Right. There's some standard carve outs there. But for the most part, I think if you're, if you're in residential, those are all recourse loans. Under right? four units and under your recourse. Correct. Yes. And Five even, I mean, some of the, I would say most loans under a million, if you go to a local bank on, on that seven unit that you were talking about, you yeah. go to a local bank, you're probably going to be personally guaranteeing that, right? Mm-hmm. Which I, I have, I mean, honestly, I have no problem with that. Uh, I, I'm confident in my ability to operate the asset, yeah. you know, no issue, but certainly if the terms are the same and I'm offered the opportunity for a non-recourse loan, I'm going to take it, Right. So I think as you get more and more properties and you get into more like JV deals or syndication, obviously the non-recourse option uh, is more attractive because right. uh, that doesn't have that personal guarantee. So freaking awesome. We could go on forever, guys, but we got to all manage right. properties and do some deals, right? And help some other people out. So Jennifer, I love you. You know, it's Thanks, so fun. Julie, I, I love these always, conversations. It is so the fun. The is guys, there are great deals out there. I am seeing better deals in the last probably four or five months than I've seen in maybe the last arguably five years. But why is that? Is it because interest rates are increasing? Because rents are going up, right? So how does rents going up translate to better deals? Yeah. So it's interesting. I think it's, I think it's the media. So the media is saying- Seller sentiment. Yes. It's the sentiment. It's like putting the screws to them. Like, I can't pay that. Interest rates are insane right now. Right. And it's you guys, it's all about the conversation to the conversion all the time, all the time, no matter what the market is. Right. So how does basically it's what's the sentiment out there right now? What's the temperature of buyers and sellers? And you got to find the pocket conversation to push towards, you know, what it is that your goals are. Right. And that right now might be interest rates suck. I can't pay that. Right. Mm-hmm. If you, if, you know, if you want that much, then I need some seller financing, yep. you know, right. and, 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 and you just, oh my God, it's so well, on the commercial side, it's easier. It's like, literally, I can't buy this property because your rents are too low yeah. relative to the price. Right. I'm so sorry. I would There's love no to emotion, it. right? There's no emotion. And it's yeah. like, and, and the brokers know that. I'm like, look, your debt coverage ratio is 1.18. Yeah. I'm not putting 50% down on this deal. You can understand why that wouldn't make sense. Therefore, I can't offer you 1.7, your asking price. I'm at 1.5. And by the way, you need to increase the rents prior to closing so that I can actually close at 1.5. Right. Your coverage ratio is too low. And for you agent investors, you broker investors out there who want to work with buyers and sellers of multifamily properties. If you're a listing agent, like I, I had a deal where offers are coming in and they're proposing to me, yep, we're going to put 30% down. And I'm like, it never, I appreciate, thank you for your offer. You will never get this through with 30% down. They're like, you're the most unprofessional person I've ever worked with, Julie. Nobody ever doesn't let the deal get signed because you think you've got the loan figure out as the broker ahead of time. I'm like, well, then that I do in my world, you know, like I know you cannot get that loan because I know how to underwrite a multifamily property. And therefore my client cannot accept and tie up this property because your loan is not achievable. I said, fine, have your lender call me. Right. Lender calls me and I say, Hey, the debt service coverage looks like this on the existing rents and blah, blah, blah. He's, I'm like, can you do it there? No. I'm like, exactly. Right. You know, it, 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 yeah, they just, they just don't know. They just don't know. Brokers, they go after this, other brokers this podcast. don't know. <laughs> yeah. Other brokers don't know guys. So that right. makes you, if you get what we're talking about, you learn how to be an underwriting expert, then you're not only a good investor, you can be a broker investor, which is agents invest is all about that. You know, um, we love talking about that. So, all right, well, let's wrap it up. So fun. 
Yeah. Good stuff. One forever. Poor Joe right. doesn't even get a word in. <laughs> Joe is like the smartest guy in on the planet because I'm, he right. has to take notes and he probably <laughs> is like this secret mastermind, brilliant, you know, because he's always listening to he, everybody he gets it all me. I can't even remember what we talked about the moment we jump off here. <laughs> I have to re-listen to even remember what it is because we do so many of these and I talk to so many people. So, you know, we love you, Joe. Thanks, Joe. We love you. We love you. He makes it all happen for sure. Um, all right, guys. Well, that's it. Jennifer, how can people get in your world? Yeah. If you're an investor and you want to learn more about what we talked about today, uh, addicted to ROI.com is our website. If you're an agent and you want to learn more about the investment side of the business, which in my opinion is the best side, go to agentsinvest.com. We'd love to have a conversation. And then soon next time I'll drop my SaaS company. Heck yeah. Well, we'll hook us up, Jennifer, when you're ready. You know it. We'll do a new podcast on, let you screen share on that and show us how it works. Does that sound good? Good stuff. All right, guys. Well, I think if you guys, if this is your first time here, thanks for joining us today. Um, I'll remind you, if you like the content, please hit the, whatever you say, the bell or the button or the subscribe. Button. I don't know what they call it. That's Joe's. Leave a review too. Yes, please. Guys, to help us reviews. continue to drag in the talent like Miss Jennifer Beatles here. Um, really yeah, Julie out. puts out free content. Julie and Joe put out free content every week for you guys. Appreciate yeah. it. The best thing you could do is leave them a five star review. And we're going to give it back to you because we're inviting you every Thursday, guys who's listening, audience, to join us from 1130 to 1230 here Pacific time where we have an open discussion mastermind on whatever topics people need help with. They have questions about whatever we have a, basically a collective, I'm stealing the word collective genius. So that's coined by somebody else, but that's kind of what it is, right? We get these people together, lenders, property managers, private money lenders, hard money lenders, uh, you name it, burrs, people flips, you know, multifamily. And we have an open discussion about whatever comes up. And we've been doing it for years. And you'd think I'd be bored as hell. And every time I am so glad that I came, it is it's just different every week. And we record those conversations as well, guys. So if you're a member of Seattle Investors Club, only costs 220 bucks a year, a total steal, you can get access to those recordings. Okay. But the best thing to do is show up, network, deals are flying around, get your questions answered live you know, whatever you want, but we hope to see you there. Joel put the link down there below. The link never changes every week. We hope that we, Jennifer and I are giving you the collective hug here and Joe, and we will see you next time. How about that? Anything else anybody needs to Joe? No, Joe? Uh, if you guys are listening and want to get to the show notes or any of the links that we have mentioned in the podcast, head over to Seattle Investors club.com slash 167. That's Seattle Investors club.com slash 167. And like Jennifer mentioned, we would love a review. So thanks for mentioning that, Jennifer. Appreciate you. All right, guys. We'll see you next time. Ciao, ciao. Thanks for listening to the Seattle Investors Club podcast. If you have questions that you'd like to have answered on the show, shoot us an email at info at seattleinvestorsclub.com. Now go out, take that action, and build that real estate business. Thanks for listening.